Good evening, my name is Karen and I'm a Community Education Coordinator for Boulder Community Health. Welcome to tonight's lecture on the Mediterranean diet. I'd like to go over the format for the lecture. The lecture portion will last about 40 minutes. Afterwards, we'll use the remaining time for questions. Please type your short general question in the chat box below the video on your screen and we will take as many as we can. On behalf of Boulder Community Health, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Robert Feinberg. Dr. Feinberg is board certified in family medicine. He earned his medical degree from the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and as part of his studies, he followed an innovative four-year pediatric program known as Education in Pediatrics Across the Continuum. He completed his residency as a family medicine physician and hospitalist at Boulder Community Health Foothills Hospital and at St. Anthony's Family Medicine, where he was a chief resident. Dr. Feinberg sees patients at Boulder Creek Family Medicine in Boulder. Welcome. Thank you, Karen. All right, so today, uh, or this evening, I'll be talking to you about the uh, Mediterranean diet. And uh, I, think we're, uh, I think we're ready to go. Okay. So, uh, like, like Karen introduced, my name is Robert Feinberg. I am a uh, full-time physician here at um, BCH, uh, but I am also a husband, a father of three, uh, and I do, I do love to cook. Uh, so today, I'm going to talk to you about something that uh, is near and dear to my heart, and that is food. Uh, as a primary care physician, I'm always interested in diet and how it affects the health of my patients. Um, actually, in fact, uh, I also run a, uh, a weight loss and metabolic health uh, program at, at my clinic. All right. So, um, got to disclaimer and disclosures, I've got no financial interest uh, in the Mediterranean region, although if anyone would like to sponsor a research trip for me there, uh, I'm open. A uh, special thank you to Elizabeth Cruz. Um, these slides are mostly hers from her last presentation on this uh, subject. Um, and uh, so we'll just be going through those. Um, I'm a primary care physician. I'm not a dietitian or an expert on all the research, uh, but I do enjoy to cook and I feel like this is uh, a wonderful uh, framework uh, with which to do that. Um, you know, as, as part of my, my medical practice, kind of, like I said, um, I become very interested in using food uh, as, part of, as part of medicine and not just instead of. Um, and I think that, um, you know, a lot of people always like to see, like, how does, how does wine fit into the, uh, the program and, uh, you know, how much, how much is healthy, how much is too much. Um, we'll talk about all of that. Okay, so there are many diets that are out there. There's the paleo diet, there's the low carb diet, there's the reduced fat diet, there's the keto diet, there's the Atkins diet, there's Weight Watchers, there's Nutrisystem, uh, and there's Metafast, and et cetera, et cetera. And when someone's got something to sell, there's a diet for that. Um, but which one's the right one? Um, you know, there's a, a lot of information out there. It can be very confusing, even for us as healthcare providers. Um, it's kind of hard to discern what data is is the most beneficial. What you know, what has the most evidence behind it? Um, it's not it's not an easy landscape to uh, to navigate. Um, and then actually, as physicians, we don't don't get a lot of training in nutrition or nutrition counseling. Uh, it's something we tend to pick up on the way um, because this often falls to us uh, because seeing a dietitian is not always covered by insurance. Um, but although hopefully in the future that, that changes. So which diet to pick? Uh, I guess it depends on what your goal is. Um, you kind of have to pick what's right for you. Um, there, there has been some, uh, there's been plenty of studies that show, you know, high fat versus, or sorry, low fat versus low carb, and which is better. And really at the end of the day, it's kind of what, what fits into, into your, into your lifestyle. Um, so, uh, what you know, we, we use the word diet a lot, um, and that is not to say that people should be going on diets um, because they are inherently short-term 
and they don't last and people rebound from them. When I use the word diet, I am referring more to nutrition and kind of even in my clinic, I, I try to use the word nutrition more than, than diet because I think it's really what we're talking about here. Um, so moving on, a little some humor here, appreciate it. So, um, you know, so what do we do? Uh, it's, you know, there's, there's so many different options that are out there. Ultimately, we just kind of give up and we kind of fall back to what's, what's easy. Um, this was a, uh, an article from a few years back, you know, it, you know, something new under the sun. I think it's kind of cute. It's kind of, it's been here for decades, centuries even. Um, and that's just what we call, what we call the Mediterranean diet. We'll get in a little bit more into, into what we mean by that. Um, but for the next few minutes, oh, excuse me, um, sorry. For the next few minutes, I'm just going to present um, the, the pattern of eating, which is kind of known as the Mediterranean diet, how this can benefit your health. Um, and not just about the, the diet or nutrition, but also about some lifestyle choices that go along with it that, that, are, that kind of create the holistic pattern of a good, healthy living. All right. So um, it doesn't have to be complicated. Michael Pollan had this great quote from the Omnivore's uh, Dilemma. Eat real food, mostly plants, and not too much. And it oversimplifies really what we're, what we're trying to do here, but it's, it's also nice and simple. And so I think it's a great, uh, a great guideline or guide, guidepost for us. So um, benefits of the Mediterranean diet. So um, unlike many other diets promoted over the years, the evidence for benefits with the Mediterranean food pattern is pretty consistent, and there have been uh, numerous studies, so we'll go through those. Um, just kind of going through this list, reducing the risk of developing type 2 diabetes, improving blood sugar control with people who have diabetes, preventing cardiovascular disease and mortality. Uh, and what I would actually like to say about those first three uh, lines is that um, cardiovascular disease, and what do I mean? Um, and the mortality associated with that. So that would be heart attack and stroke um, and uh, mortality from diabetes um, accounted for almost 1 million deaths in 2021. So we're not talking about an insignificant uh, uh, part of the population here. But in addition, may reduce age-related cognitive decline. We'll talk about that. Uh, may improve longevity. We can define a little bit more about what longevity would be. So um, we're not just talking about um, reaching the, uh, you know, extending life span, but also um, extending the quality of that life, which I think that everybody would, would be interested in doing. And, you know, there is some evidence uh, that it might reduce even some cancer risk um, to eat this one. So, um, you know, there's been a kind of this renewed focus on the med diet um, and a kind of more of a holistic view of nutrition and lifestyle rather than focusing on, you know, is it a low-carb low diet? Is it an all-protein diet? Is it a low-fat diet, et cetera? All right, so um, there are uh, similar diets to the Mediterranean diet, and they kind of all kind of get to the, um, the same route, but some of those are the, the DASH diet, um, which is what we use. Uh, we've been using traditionally in healthcare to help reduce hypertension without the use of medications or in, um, in, in, in addition to use of medications. There's a new dietary guidelines for Americans by the ADA, uh, and then there's you know, a healthy vegetarian diet. And we'll discuss these uh, in this full Venn diagram here. So um, here are uh, kind of the, the three diets that we talked about, maybe not the vegetarian one, but there's the USDA food patterns, the DASH diet, the Mediterranean diet. Um, they all emphasize the intake of vegetables, uh, fruits, whole grains, and lean proteins, and healthy fats. So all the stuff that you would see kind of on the periphery of the, um, of the supermarket. Um, and then the Mediterranean diet um, generally focuses more on a lower meat intake, higher fat content. Um, but those fats are unsaturated fats. And what I like to tell my patients um, are unsaturated fats are the ones that are liquid at room temperature. So anything that's solid um, at room temperature generally is saturated and there's chemical pro um, properties as to why that's the, the case, but it's a good um, kind of uh, good estimate as to what's saturated versus unsaturated. So things that would be saturated fat would be like animal fats, uh, butter, uh, even coconut oil uh, is, is high in saturated fat. Um, kind of going through a little bit more of the um, 
the, the, co the comparison here. The Mediterranean diet has less dairy than the uh, American diet, uh, dietary recommendations. Um, and then it also mentions kind of moderate intake of red wine and alcohol. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and back in 2020, the Mediterranean diet was rated the number one best diet of overall. And um, we'll talk about that, but I, you know, we'll um, talk a little bit more about kind of what that means and kind of how holistically to, to think about this. Um, but what's really nice about it is that, you know, it's flexible. So it's, there's no um, specific cookbook that you have to buy for it. There's no uh, food that you have to necessarily completely eliminate from the diet. So it's accessible. Um, there is evidence for its benefits. Um, you know, there's not too much about it about weight loss, but um, I, I think it's kind of inherent in, in the diet. Something else that you know the Mediterranean diet has is maybe a little bit more prep work than, than some other um, ways of eating, um, but we'll talk about those as well. Um, so uh, there's uh, there's the, the seven countries study uh, that was, it's kind of interesting uh, by Ansel Keys, um, and this was done I think back 19. 50, 1950s, I believe, 1940s, oh, 1950s. Um, it was, he was a cardiovascular researcher, and he noted a high rate of heart attacks and vascular disease among uh, men in Minnesota and wondered if there was a reason to that, was it their diet or other behaviors. So he and uh, some colleagues in Italy uh, noted a lower rate of cardiovascular disease in kind of the working class population after World War II um, in, in those villages, and noted that these Italian populations engaged in modern physical activity, um, drank wine in moderation with meals, and um, had a little bit more social uh, engagement during their meals. So they developed the seven countries uh, trial, which is kind of interesting. It's actually still ongoing, um, even 50 years later, and there's some, some really great data around it. Um, this is like one of the many uh, slides associated kind of with the trial. The, um, on the, let's see, the left axis is the 25 year um, mortality rate from uh, cardiovascular disease. And then there's this, this factor score, which I, I'll, I'll be honest, I was looking to see what exactly went into these, these food groups and um, I couldn't see exactly what those 18 food groups were. Um, I could probably just dig a little bit deeper, but the next slide will kind of get into, into what that is. But looking at uh, this uh, axis, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer or not, but if you look at um, uh, the this right here, this A and the U, and the, or the W, that's kind of in the upper right-hand corner. The A is the United States, W is West Finland, and E, the far, far right, is East Finland. Um, Z is Yugoslavia, and that's kind of right in the middle, um, kind of with more butter, cream, margarine, and other sources of trans fats in, the, in those. And then if you look in the lower left-hand, or kind of like the mid to lower left, you see M is uh, Montenegro, G and K are in Greece. Um, D is, is Croatia, and U and T are Japan. Um, but anyway, so they surveyed the populations on dietary intake and scored them on the adherence to this more healthy eating pattern. That's the, that factor score. Uh, a more negative uh, food factor score indicated greater adherence to a healthier eating pattern. And then, like I said, they plotted it on, on this chart. So here's a nice, pretty uh, graphic on this one. Let's talk about the Mediterranean diet pyramid, which is a little bit different than uh, the USDA one was back in the day. What I want to kind of draw your attention to first is the base. And the base doesn't have anything to do with food. It has to do with getting activity. It has to do with having, um, enjoying meals with others where you talk and slow the meal down. I think that's actually really important because I find that people who eat very quickly tend to eat more. Um, but um, so again, so this is kind of like a, a pattern of not just eating, but total lifestyle, exercise, socializing, etc. And it's pretty inclusive. But you say like, there are a lot of different types of food in this pyramid, right? The base has fruits, vegetables, whole grains, olive oil, um, kind of beans, legumes, etc. And then as you kind of move up, next you've got, you know, fish and seafood, which has a lot of good omega-3 fatty acids, which are known to be good for uh, cardiovascular health. Then you kind of get up and then you're starting, okay, well now we're getting to kind of the higher fat foods, um, poultry, eggs, uh, some cheeses and yogurts. At the very top are the meats and meats and sweets. So things that you can still have, maybe a little bit more in moderation. And then, you know, when you kind of look to the left of this uh, pyramid, you've got the beverages, right? So water, um, 
water is obviously an excellent uh, source of hydration, and then wine. And so um, I, I'm not sure that they actually isolated the, the benefits of, of, of wine and, and what the, the appropriate amount of that would be. But um, if I can give just a word of advice, probably no more than a glass a night would probably be the optimal. All right. And then um, and, uh, looking at a plate, I think uh, a lot of people have seen kind of like the whole plate uh, way of eating before, and I think it's still very applicable. Um, this is, I think, is from the uh, the VA, um, and it shows half half the plate is vegetables, right? Uh, and a little more than a quarter is whole grains, and then you've got a little bit of a little bit of uh, meat in the, in the lower right hand corner there. Uh, fruit is an excellent uh, is an excellent uh, dessert. And then there's your water. All right, a little bit of humor for you. Um, so we're talking about the evidence of a medicine, uh, Mediterranean diet uh, and, and weight loss, not specifically to it, but it might be useful given its flexibility and health benefits. Um, and, um, you know, again, I think that the, what we're kind of saying here with the slide is that um, going on a diet usually doesn't end well. Right. I mean, yes, you'll, you might lose a couple pounds, but then as soon as you come off of it, because it's not sustainable, the weight comes back. So rather, why don't we think about how to change the weight that you live your life? All right. So Mediterranean diet. Uh, there was a systemic review of multiple trials looking at the Mediterranean diet and weight loss, um, including about a thousand uh, overweight uh, people. Um, the trials included nutritional counseling and two thirds had an exercise prescription. Um, similar amounts of diet of weight loss among uh, different diets, but the trials did note that there was greater improvement uh, in blood sugar control with patients with diabetes. That's that's not that's not nothing. Um, and then um, what's also really nice about the Mediterranean diet is that um, these foods are high in anti-inflammatory compounds, like omega three fatty acids, like I mentioned before, antioxidants that are found in a variety of fruits and vegetables. Um, and then, you know, a lot of thought and actually some research has been gone into thinking about um, the anti-inflammatory properties of the diet and could this reduce cancer. Um, some randomized head-to-head -head, uh, studies are, they're, they're hard to do, especially when you're talking about diet. Um, it's hard to uh, confine people to a very specific way of eating um, in the real world. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but there was this other systemic, uh, systematic review, excuse me, of uh, about 560 trials um, that um, had about, uh, let's see, about a half a million uh, participants. Um, they're, obs again, observational. Um, you can't do a double blind on this one. Um, you know, they're, again, hard to do in the real world. Um, but it looked at, um, the, you know, there was an association of uh, the Mediterranean diet and lower cancer risk. Again, associations, hard to say if it was causal. Um, but there was this interesting uh, study, uh, the PrettyMed. Um, it was a randomized trial, um, but it wasn't like a double blind, uh, where they did see a reduction in bre uh, breast cancer uh, in the Mediterranean arm, which I thought was interesting. Um, then there was the uh, EPIC trial, um, uh, which started in the 1990s with a large cohort of people across uh, 10 European countries. Um, they got a baseline diet information and then they followed them. And those um, eating more fruits and vegetables seem to protect against colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and lung cancer, um, and maybe even some prostate cancer as well. Eating more fish and less red meat uh, and processed meat were also related to lower colon and breast cancer. Now there is um, some, there is another study that counteracts that a little bit that says it's actually more to do with the amount of vegetables, a little bit less to do with uh, the amount of red uh, and processed meats uh, there. But, you know, the, the idea was to kind of investigate the, you know, what, what's causal or what's, what's correlated here. So um, along the same lines, there's been interest in the role of diet and the risk of developing forgetfulness, dementia, other cognitive decline um, as people age. Um, and, you know, there's all these little bits of, you know, how they can how they can help you out potentially. My own observation um, where, with my patients, when I get, uh, we get brain MRIs for whatever reason, we often see what kind of in quote, or in quote, what I would quote is age-related brain atrophy due to small vessel disease. Um, and effectively saying that um, people who have high inflammation, they have um, you know, increased uh, disease process in the microvasculature in the brain, and we see atrophy due to that. And so, potentially uh, leading 
to um, you know earlier onset dementia or cognitive decline. Um, so you know um, dementias are uh, increasing in frequency. Um, can't really chalk that up to people living longer because they're they're really not. Um, you know, we, we don't have treatments to reverse the disease uh, once the symptoms be, uh, begin, but if we can reduce the frequency or delay the onset, we can improve the quality of life uh, for people and, frankly, uh, reduce the cost of uh, healthcare. Um, obviously, further research is needed. Uh, I can imagine like, these types of studies are, are really hard to do um, and uh, would have to take like decades, uh, which requires a lot of funding. And frankly, there's, there's not that much money in, in pharma to, to fund these uh, to, to really to follow that up. Um, but there are many observational studies that have suggest that a healthy diet may reduce the risk of the cognitive decline, um, including following the, the Mediterranean diet, um, six of the 12 studies um, showed benefit. Um, you know, they're very heterogeneous, so kind of hard to say really what, what's causing what. Um, but the pretty med uh, subgroup analysis did show significant improvement in cognitive testing, which is interesting. All right. Um, so the, let's talk a little bit more about the PREDIMED diet. So a uh, PREDIMED uh, study. Uh, it was done in Spain um, where uh, they were looking at uh, three different diets. Uh, two were Mediterranean-based. One had uh, was focusing on extra virgin olive oil, uh, and all of all of that oil was um, supplied to those participants. A third of the study was another Mediterranean diet, which they had like uh, like nuts and things like that were, were emphasized. And then a third was just kind of have at it the way you are, and uh, we'll talk about the um, outcomes there. All right, so um, in that, um, what we find is, you know, reduction in chronic disease equals longer life. And it makes sense that if the diet reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer, longevity would be improved overall. Um, uh, longevity has been shown, in, or increased longevity has been shown uh, in groups following the Mediterranean diet versus the Western diet, multiple studies, um, even in some randomized trials as well. Um, Got, uh, yeah, there was a, a multi-ethnic cohort study, there was a large observational epi uh, epidemiologic study, and two uh, randomized trials that have shown increase in life expectancy. Um, the multi-ethnic the multi -ethnic cohort was uh, 200,000 people over um, 13 to uh, 18 years with uh, baseline food questionnaires, which is not perfect, but it's kind of what, what you can do with a limited amount of money. Um, and it looked um, at the association between, you know, death, cancer, cardiovascular disease between that and the Mediterranean diet. Um, so what about the Mediterranean diet and diabetes? So multiple studies have examined the effect of, multiple, of the Mediterranean diet and the prevention or uh, the treatment of type 2 diabetes in adult, uh, in adult onset. Um, new onset type 2 diabetes is a global epidemic, like I, like I told you about. Um, over 100,000 people uh, died from complications with, uh, from such. Um, costs the, the world about $600 billion. Uh, that's not, not an insignificant amount of money. Um, uh, the, um, I'm um, oh, sorry, cost $140 billion, sorry, estimated to, to cost up to $600 billion worldwide by 2035. Um, nutrition is integral. You know, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, um, true type 2 diabetes, insulin resistant, um, is a lifestyle disease. Uh, it just, there is some hereditary to it, but uh, it is largely uh, based off of our diet and lifestyle. Um, and um, so how does the Mediterranean diet help us here? Well, it can lower the BMI and waist circumference. Um, reducing uh, the hemoglobin A1C uh, by 0.5% doesn't sound a, like a, a lot, but um, as anyone who prescribes medications will tell you, that's actually a significant uh, amount. Um, it can help reduce uh, the, uh, the incident of metabolic syndrome, uh, which is a conglomerate of uh, diseases such as high blood pressure, uh, dyslipidemia, uh, diabetes, uh, insulin resistance, large waste, uh, et cetera. Um, and the Mediterranean diet also has other beneficial cardiovascular uh, benefits. Um, so we've alluded to several times, but what about heart disease. So 
Uh, just review, cholesterol is, the, is key in the development of heart attacks and strokes, cardiovascular disease, as well as hypertension. Um, this is kind of interesting. During biopsies of young uh, children's coronary arteries uh, after death to other causes, such as trauma, it actually shown the beginning of plaque formation, which is, I think, like, kind of mind-blowing. Um, but, you know, bad cholesterol, what we call bad cholesterol, the low-density lipoproteins, the very low-density lipoprotein cholesterols build up in arteries. Um, diet can reduce uh, the amount that's circulating and therefore reduce kind of that area under the curve and, and the progression of, of, of the disease. Um, in addition, uh, what is uh, key for atherosclerosis is inflammation inside the arteries. Um, and as we, we talked about in the Mediterranean diet, there are certain, certain anti-inflammatory properties of those foods that can help reduce, uh, you know, reduce that process. Um, so, you know, we talked about uh, certain lifestyle changes uh, that can that can affect uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, you know, weight loss. Uh, nutrition with more fruit, vegetables, less salt uh, can positively affect the function of important organ systems, kind of all detailed here, brain, vasculature, kidneys. Kidneys are personally my favorite. It's, it's my favorite organ in the body. Um, but it can also, reduce, uh, it can also um, decrease arterial stiffness, right? So then we talk about risk of heart attack and stroke. Um, you know, if, you know, and we can reduce the, just the burden on, on, on everybody by, by following healthier lifestyles. Um, some other interesting trials that were uh, uh, displayed or that, that, were, that were done is the Lionheart study, which actually was a secondary prevention uh, uh, study. And just to um, educate a little bit, so there's primary prevention and there's secondary prevention. Primary prevention is the steps that we do to prevent a disease from occurring for the first time. Um, secondary prevention is the things are the things that we do um, to prevent it from happening again. So the Lionheart study was a secondary prevention uh, study. It was done um, looking, so people who have had a cardiovascular event, they were put on a Mediterranean diet versus um, no specific recommendations. And there was a, actually a massive reduction in the, in the current uh, coronary events. Now, the, the absolute numbers were smaller, but, the, um, but a 73% reduction in recurrent coronary events at 27 months follow-up is pretty amazing. Um, you know, there are some problems with the way the study was conducted, but the results were, like I said, pretty impressive. Um, and it's consistent with the theory that components of this diet have anti-inflammatory effects. Um, you know, it, it says like there's a 4% difference in the total fat consumed. That doesn't sound like a lot, but the saturated fat is the, is the big deal there. Um, the, the PREDIMED style, uh, excuse me, um, uh, trial, um, was a, uh, was a primary prevention, um, was a study, it was a multi-center randomized trial in Spain. So probably at baseline already a better diet than we have the standard American diet. Uh, about 7,500 people, uh, 55 to 80 years old with no history of cor uh, uh, coronary vascular disease, um, but we're at high risk. Uh, there was, the Mediterranean diet was um, supplemented with olive oil or nuts, like I was mentioning, or there was just a counseling on just a low fat diet. Um, and the primary endpoint was a major cardiovascular event. So uh, myocardial infarction, stroke, or death from cardiovascular disease. It was actually stopped early uh, due to the benefit. I always love when trials are stopped early because it just means it was, it was, so, it was so good uh, that no, no further data was, was needed. Um, all right. So, um, so like I said, they, they were, it was stopped early because they were hoping for a 20% difference. Uh, and they saw a decrease in the incidence of 30% or even before they they were expecting to. So uh, again, pretty impressive. Um, another way to look at this uh, data from this trial is to ask kind of what was the number of people that I need to treat? So yeah, this number needed to treat is, a, is an interesting statistic. Uh, it's actually one that we use a lot in medicine, which is if I'm gonna treat somebody for uh, a disease or to prevent a disease, how many do I have to treat to save a life or to save an event. Um, so um, if we look at this, so the primary cardiovascular disease endpoint, uh, so death, heart attack, stroke, is one in seven, so 75 people. I have to put 75 people on the diet to prevent this from happening, which frankly for things that we do anyway, eating 
is, is pretty impressive. But then if you look at type 2 diabetes, it's only 28 people. Uh, peripheral artery disease is 85, and atrial fibrillation is 65. Um, which I, you know, I think is, again, for something that we do every day, I think is fantastic. It's better than a pill. Um, so what does this mean to, uh, for in our day-to-day -day lives, right? So it sounds like a good idea, but how do I implement this? Um, what does uh, an increased vegetarian, uh, vegetable and fruit intake look like? And what if I don't like fish? Um, does Mediterranean mean pizza and pasta? Uh, I mean, remember, the Mediterranean diet, uh, Mediterranean encompasses 15 different countries, Italian, French, Arab, African. There's no pure diet that encompasses all of that. But it's kind of, like I said, you know, general guidelines of, about what we're looking at. Um, I guess technically you could find a way to eat Mexican food in a Mediterranean way. Um, but a recent study that looked at applying the concepts to even Indian Asian culture saw a 50% reduction in non-fatal heart attacks and a 60% uh, in sudden cardiac death. So again, what we're talking about is not a diet. We're talking about an eating pattern. So, um, you know, and again, we're not really talking about losing weight, um, but eating this way actually might be more satisfying and may lead to that. So, you know, it's eating with our eyes, nose, mouth, and kind of enjoying the experience holistically, eating with, um, eating with our friends and our family to slow our, our eating speed down. Its base is vegetables, fruits, and grains, um, which can increase your fiber intake. Um, I generally recommend my patients get about 30 grams of fiber a day. Um, and this is a great way to do it. Um, fiber decreases uh, cholesterol circulating in the blood. It binds in the gut and it helps to escort that out. Um, and it helps you feel full. Uh, and again, potentially will lower the amount of calories that you actually eat. So um, again, it's, it's not a low fat diet uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, it's actually higher in fat than some other Diets. And again, let me, let, me, let me rephrase that. It is not a low-fat uh, like, nu um, nutrition plan or anything like that. Um, again, I, I want to kind of stay away from diet in the, in the way that we usually define it. Um, but it is low in saturated fat, and I think that's really the most important thing. And again, saturated fats are the ones that are solid at room temperature. Um, the American Heart Association recommends no more than a tablespoon per day, or about 13 grams. Um, higher in polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats, which are also liquid at room temperature, and provide nutrients we can make. Um, so besides oils, fats can come from other sources. Uh, dairy, for instance. Um, these types of fats can raise HDL and lower LDL, uh, opposite of what saturated or animal fats can do. Um, and they can help you feel more full as well, um, which can help with weight control. But again, you know, it doesn't mean you should be drinking glasses of olive oil, it's, it's, it's still fat. All right, so um, where do we get protein? Uh, protein is very important uh, for maintaining muscle mass uh, and actually for keeping you sated very, uh, for longer periods of time. Beans, legumes, excellent sources of protein, fish, uh, white meats. Um, let me uh, go against an ad campaign that a lot of people would remember. Pork is not the other white meat, it is indeed a red meat. Um, Low-fat dairy uh, are excellent ways uh, to get good proteins, and, and there actually is proteins in, in some nuts, and we're talking about the, the raw and unsalted to keep your blood pressure down. So anyway, so focus on the plant sources. Uh, fatty fishes um, are high in omega-3, which I said can um, benefit you, uh, uh, benefit the uh, cardiovascular system. Um, there are some concerns about mercury levels in some of the deeper water fish like shark and mackerel. But um, things like salmon, tuna, pollock, kind of fish should be okay. Um, generally, the benefits outweigh the, the, the harms here. Um, I mean, there are, there are some low-fat diets um, or dairy that have some beneficial fats as well. Special occasion foods. All right, so top of that pyramid. I don't, um, I don't know if you remember seeing it, but you guys can have access to the slides afterwards. You can scroll back. Um, top of the pyramid, along with red meats, are the sweets. Again, you know, uh, I think it's uh, it's never good to restrict yourself because when you have a bad day, you're going to fall to all of those restricted um, restricted taboo foods in excess. But um, something to enjoy on occasion: um, sweets, 
Um, again, not a never thing, except for I would say soda. Soda should be a never thing. Um, even diet soda and so, um, can affect you. Um, diet soda can increase insulin levels um, in the blood, which um, it, for physiologic purposes actually can be obesogenic, even though you're not adding any calories. Um, and uh, so even changing what you drink can decrease your risk of chronic disease. Uh, chocolate is high in saturated fat, uh, but also has beneficial omega-9 uh, fatty acids um, and, you know, um, can also just be very therapeutic. So in, in moderation. Um, there's, the, there's the old 80-20 rule. You know, as long as if you get it right 80% of the time, I think you're doing great. I can't say that I'm 100% compliant with this diet. Um, you know, there's, there's a little bit to life that has to be lived. And I think if you can get it mostly correct, you're doing a great job. Alcohol, you know, there's a debate, right? There's the there's a, uh, there's a benefit, uh, potentially, uh, maybe for reducing uh, blood pressure, uh, but the therapeutic window is, is it's narrow. Um, I, would, I would not look to the Mediterranean diet as a reason to start drinking, um, but I think um, if you do enjoy a glass of wine with dinner, I think that sounds to be reasonable. Um, let's see. And then, you know, what I will say is that I'm, I'm not giving medical advice here. So um, for, for people out there, uh, if you're not, if you're unsure, you should discuss that with your physician. And then don't forget about, again, that base of the pyramid. Eat together uh, uh, with your family, with your friends, enjoy the experience. Use all five senses uh, when you're enjoying your meal. Eat mindfully. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that you will eat less just because of the time that it takes. And then move. Again, um, I cannot overemphasize the importance of, of uh, activity um, to this lifestyle. So tips. Um, meal plan. Um, use leftovers when you can instead of ordering sandwiches or eating out. Um, this doesn't have to be expensive. But what I do tell my patients as well is that frozen vegetables are just as good as fresh, fresh vegetables, and they are often cheaper. Um, shop for the week. Uh, it's a great way to, to, to plan out and then not be surprised. Um, engage the family, see what other people like, see if your kids want to cook with you. I think it's a great way to get them involved uh, and kind of pass this on to the next generation. And, you know, stick with a few recipes, you know, you know, keep it simple. Um, and then you can even prep and freeze ingredients. Um, I often uh, prep, will prep like an olive oil and roasted garlic, and I, I can use that for um, a lot of my meals um, to add quick flavor to it. Um, and then there's so many online resources that you can look at for healthy ways to cook. Um, you just need uh, the Google, which I know we all have. Um, I am not a big fan of social media, but I will on occasion go to, uh, I think it's TikTok, um, and I'll just look for some quick recipes, and it's amazing what you can learn in 30 seconds there. Um, here are just some screenshots of, uh, of a couple of things that, I, that I've taken and I've cooked. Uh, I like this guy, uh, Max Mar uh, Mariola. I have no affiliation with him. I just think he's super entertaining, um, and I've cooked multiple meals uh, from this guy, and even my five-year-old likes it. So I think, you know, he's, he's genius. Um, so how do you incorporate this into your regular meal? So again, it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to look like these foods that you see in the, in the uh, food magazines. Keep it simple. There's so much you can do with five recipes. Oh, excuse me, five ingredients. Um, again, uh, just there are uh, lots of recipes out there. These are actual pictures from uh, our table uh, at, in, in the Feinberg residence. Um, simple ways, right? So if you look at the left hand kind, this is like a maybe a Mediterranean based, you know, um, like stir fry. So I, we use tofu as a protein here. The middle one, we've got, uh, my wife makes this amazing herb crusted salmon. That's what we have here with some, some uh, roasted potatoes and some green beans. Uh, and then on, on the far right, uh, here's me, this, this, this one I cooked, uh, fully indulging in the top of the pyramid there with that with that meat. But there, what you can see there is there's a, a little um, glass jar there, and that was some herb, uh, herb roasted garlic that I put with some olive oil, and like I said, I just, it was easy for me to throw on uh, just to flavor the steak. And then I've got some bruschetta, and then it was a, um, a little salad that I made. Was, this did not take me very long. Um, great, so with that, I think I ran a little bit long. 
Um, let's open it up to some questions. And I'll, again, um, I, I will answer the best as I can, um, and we'll, we'll go from there. All right. Dr. Feinberg, thank you for that informational presentation. And we want to remind our uh, audience that at this time, if you have any questions, put into the uh, chat box below your screen and we'll get to as many as we can tonight. And these will be uh, coming in no particular order to you. So you went over um, the impact um, of the diet to diabetes and cardiovascular. We have some uh, viewers who have asked a variety of other impact or uh, additional research that you might have in recommendation for the diet. So uh, one of them was uh, if you're pregnant, uh, is that okay? Do you recommend it? What's the research say? Um, good question. Um, I'll be honest, I don't know what the research says around um, uh, pregnancy. Uh, you know, there are certain uh, fishes that uh, we definitely want to avoid, certainly the ones that have any mercury in it. Um, but having uh, omega-3 fatty acids in fish, I think, are, are very, re very reasonable. I think it's, again, the diet is, is not restrictive at all. I think that would be, um, uh, that would be, that should be fine. Um, you know, when it comes to weight gain in pregnancy, it all depends on um, the starting weight of the mother. Um, but there always should be weight gain, so there should never be weight neutrality with uh, during uh, a pregnancy. Um, you know, there are you know certain things. Certainly, if you're going to have a fish, make sure that it is cooked through. Um, you know, there are certain vegetables that are, are, are restricted uh, for you know during pregnancy, and you know, soft cheeses, things like that, um, that you want to try to avoid as well. Okay. If you have an inflamed prostate, what about that? Um, I honestly, I, I do not know what the, what the, if there's any uh, data that shows um, how this would affect an inflamed prostate. But certainly, um, you know, an inflamed prostate is usually an acute process. Uh, and I would, I would say, I would defer to your physician uh, to, to figure out what is going on there. But um, for general uh, inflammation, like I said, there are a lot of uh, anti-inflammatory uh, properties of having a, a lots of fruits and vegetables in your diet. Okay. What if you have insulin resistance? Insulin resistance, my uh, one of my favorite topics. Um, so a lot of the, the patients that I see um, in my in my weight loss uh, clinic. Um, do not have diabetes. So generally what we do is we check an A1C and it's less than 5.7 and we're like, oh, you're fine. But one thing I do actually also evaluate is the insulin level in um, in the blood with, um, and compare that with the uh, glucose level. And with that, I can get an idea about whether someone is insulin resistant. And insulin resistance is the precursor to diabetes. So uh, the things that we do uh, are, we want to minimize the amount of insulin that is produced by the pancreas to resensitize all of the cells in, in the body. So um, there are multiple ways to do that. There's ways to do that with diet, and believe it or not, there's ways to do that with exercise. Um, starting with diet, uh, things that we want to do is minimize the simple carbohydrates, the white breads, the um, you know the white rice, the really processed uh, types of things. It doesn't mean that carbohydrates have to be out of the diet. Um, carbohydrates are extremely important for organs such as the brain that only use um, glucose for uh, for fuel. Um, but what we like, what we can do is we can actually structure the diet a little bit where the carbohydrates or the simpler ones, uh, grains, things like that, can come at the end of the meal and that will actually reduce the amount of insulin the pancreas has to produce and then thereby um, reducing over a long period of time the sensitivity to the cells. Um, in addition, uh, what we can, what you can do also is after dinner or after a meal, take a walk. And the reason why that is so important is that there are non-insulin dependent uh, glucose transporters in the muscles of our body. And when we use those after a meal, it can pull sugar into, or the glucose into our muscles without ha the pancreas having to increase the insulin levels to do that. So that would be a, a lifestyle way or a, a non-diet way to, to do that as well. That is still consistent with the Mediterranean uh, lifestyle. If you develop um, type 2 diabetes and you're in your 50s or 60s, what is the impact of this diet on that? Sure. I'm kind of, I think, uh, like, like, like I discussed, um, 
type two diabetes is not an all all is lost um, diagnosis. Uh, there, um, it is a again, it's a, it is a more um, I guess a more advanced uh, form of insulin resistance, um, and so engaging in a diet that is low in simple sugars, high in fiber, which um, reduces gastric emptying, um, also lowers the need or lowers the 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 rate of uh, glucose being uh, uh, brought into the blood, which then lowers that insulin uh, requirement. Um, certainly, it, it depends on how advanced the, that um, the type two diabetes is, uh, but certainly can reduce A1C, uh, uh, like I mentioned, by up to zero, uh, up to 05 uh, percent, um, uh, just with diet. And I want to give a better idea about what the zero point five percent really means. So, um, a normal A1C level is up to five point six percent. The pre, what we call a pre-diabetic. Uh, range is 5.7 to 6.4 percent, and then about 6.5 percent or higher is is what we classify as diabetes. So when we talk about 0.5 percent, I mean that's actually quite a bit when we're talking about these ranges. Okay. Uh, another example of is this diet good for this particular thing? Microscopic colitis, and is it better than the inflammatory diet? Uh, that is a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, but um, certainly eating a high fiber diet uh, is healthy for the digestive tract, mm -hmm. including the colon. Um, but uh, I would defer to your gastroenterologist uh, for, for, I guess, further refinement, finding, refinement of that answer. Uh, but I, uh, I, I, would, I would be surprised if he said that this was uh, detrimental to it. Uh, if you have high cholesterol, is it still okay to eat avocados? How many, and how about eggs? Um, so if they have high cholesterol, is that the? Um, so yes, I, I mean, the, the what we're looking at here is, again, we were looking at the omega-3 fatty acids, um, which have been shown to decrease the uh, the amount of low density lipoprotein cholesterol that's uh, that's floating in the blood and potentially increasing the high density lipoprotein cholesterol in the blood. Um, so um, I think that uh, those types of fats are good. And yes, those are the kind that you can find in avocado, avocados, avocado oil, um, olive oil, et cetera. Um, eggs, you know, they, they do have a lot of cholesterol. It just kind of, they, they do. I mean, you could, I guess, do egg whites or occasionally enjoy eggs. Like I said, the, the whole part about this diet is that it's not restrictive, but it's really kind of a guideline as to, you know, proportion of the foods that you eat. Um, and um, so I, I don't think any, any food is off the table. It's just a matter of uh, the dose. So not a specific recommendation on number of avocados, et cetera. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that would be, that's hard to say. No, I do not have a specific recommendation on the amount of avocados. Okay. Uh, is this diet healthier than a keto diet? Um, I will say yes, it is. Um, I, I am personally not a, a huge fan of the keto diet for several reasons. Um, one, the, the biggest one is that I just don't think it's sustainable. And I think the keto diet is something, and, and listen, there, there are people out there that have maintained this for years, so um, I will say on the whole, it is a harder diet to adhere to. The, the ketogenic diet also um, is high in, high in fat. I mean, it's mainly a low carbohydrate diet, or low to no, and it's not, you know, not absolutely no, but um, there, there have been, I mean, it, it just shows like there, there is higher cholesterol in people that follow the ketogenic diet on the whole. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, a, a high cholesterol diet or a, a, you know, a higher cholesterol can lead to uh, atherosclerotic disease. So um, I would say that the Mediterranean way of, or the Mediterranean lifestyle is, uh, is on the balance healthier than, than the ketogenic diet. Now, I, let me preface that by saying that people lose a lot of weight using the ketogenic diet. Um, uh, I've also seen uh, in my clinic, a lot of patients that come to me says, yeah, I've lost all this weight. And then I went back to eating normally and it all came back. So I guess it kind of depends on what you're looking, what, looking to do there. Okay. 
So on the flip side of, of this, um, are there any negatives to this diet? Um, I guess that depends on the person. I mean, it's, it's for people who are not used to this diet, it is a new way of cooking. Um, it is uh, unfortunately uh, more expensive than fast food. Um, and uh, for people, you know, again, for people who are not used to cooking or don't have time, you know, there's, there are a lot of really busy people out there. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's hard to buy fresh ingredients all the time. And, um, I think there are ways to get around that, but it, it's a learning curve. Um, but I think once you get there, um, it's, it's worth it. Um, other than that, uh, I, I can't really think of, uh, like big red flags as to why this would be uh, a harmful diet. Okay. So you had mentioned the avocado oil. What about coconut oil? Is uh, that good or bad? I've got a view on coconut oil and it's not good. Um, I, uh, you know, uh, coconut oil um, uh, was uh, a couple years back uh, kind of promoted as this, you know, healthy uh, way to cook. Um, and like I mentioned, I mean, again, everything in moderation, but coconut oil is saturated fat. Kind of, you know, and I, you know, I'll tell a lot of my patients that it is really not much healthier for you than butter is. Uh, and it's just, it has just, about, just as much saturated fat in it. And if you kind of just break it down by that, then um, I would say it is, no, I, I would say it is, of the, of the types of oils and fats that you could use, it is on the less healthy of that spectrum. Okay. And then... Uh, kind of a lead on to that. Um, how does avocado oil compare to olive oil? Oh, great question. I think they're pretty comparable. I think um, uh, you're splitting hairs a little bit uh, about which is healthier or not. I think they're both very healthy uh, as far as oils go. Um, and I think, you know, if, if you like the taste of one versus the other, I think that it's reasonable to, uh, to pick that one. Okay. Uh, a lot of people are asking for types of recommendations. We'll ask this one right now. What fruits are best? Oh, yeah. Um, so fruits that are best would be ones that are high in fiber. It's the one I recommend to my patients. And so what are what are those? Um, uh, again, you can you can type in Google and be and say fruits with the highest amount of fiber. And what you're going to find are apples, pears, berries. Uh, bananas uh, are, are really good as well. Um, one that, I, that a, lot, a lot of my patients uh, will eat, um, which uh, they love because they're delicious, are grapes, but they are little, sh like they're little sugar bombs. They are not very much fiber, a lot of, uh, a lot of sugar. They will, they will spike your, your blood uh, glucose level and insulin levels. I also tell my patients to uh, try to avoid dried fruits, uh, again, in moderation, I think you know a couple here and there are fine, but um, just the sheer volume that, of dried fruits that you can eat compared to them when they're hydrated uh, is pretty staggering. I, I always use the example like you know you could probably eat six uh, uh, dried apricots while you're thinking about whether you want to eat something or not, and but if you actually try to eat eat hydrated ones, and good luck, you know. So um, regarding fruits, that's kind of how I approach that couple of questions about how uh, data has changed over the years. Uh, this one is asking about dairy, um, asking if full fat dairy is better than non-fat because non-fat may have sugars added to it or just the full fat in the uh, whole milk is, is better. Well, uh, the fats in milk are saturated, fat, are, are saturated fats or a combination of such. I would say that if you take things kind of pure to like pure to pure, like the lower fats are the better ones. Um, uh, but again, everything in moderation. Um, you know, I you know, yes, if 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 there was like a milk with you know twenty grams of sugar added to it, I would question if that's even one if that's even milk. But um, but I would, I would question if that's even like a you know. A, a healthy drink or is that just basically a sugar or a, a soda substitute versus something that didn't but you know um, as far as I know my most milks I do not think have added sugar to them um, when you look at and, and maybe this is more um, pointed towards yogurts and I think 
Yogurts are a minefield if you really look at them. Um, there are types of, and I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to uh, call it any particular brands, but there are yogurts that have just a tremendous amount of sugar added. I mean, it's almost as much as a can of Coca-Cola. Um, uh, and there are some that are, have higher fat, but don't have any added sugar and they're delicious. And so I think if that's what we're talking about, I would definitely go to the more, maybe the more uh, fuller fat, no sugar or minimal sugar added uh, yogurt versus a high sugar, low fat, uh, low fat um, yogurt. Okay. You had also mentioned BMI um, and this person is saying, um, is that even an indicator anymore? They thought that it had been discredited as a method of determining health. Uh, it's a great question. Um, I don't think it is discredited uh, as a as a, but it is. It's not the best. Uh, it's not the best indicator for someone's body composition. And I think as we get a little bit smarter about body composition. Um, there are there are metrics. There's you know lean appendicular mass. There's central adiposity. There's um, just been metabolic rate. I mean, there are people um, who have BMIs of 30, 35, who even have central adiposity, who are super active. And I can argue to say that they are actually a healthier human being than someone who has a BMI of 20, who doesn't really have any much muscle mass, who sits on the couch all day. So yes, I mean, it's it's very nuanced, um, but. You know, BMI is not, I would not say it's garbage in terms of a, a, of a health indicator. It's just there, you know, we can get very granular with, with other metrics. Are some kinds of whole grain breads better than others? And is wild caught fish better than uh, non wild fish? Oh, we're, getting, we're, getting, we're getting deep here. Um, I would say, again, when you're looking at breads, um, what you want to look for is as as few or as little added sugar as possible and high, uh, high fiber as possible. That is still palatable. Um, but I, you know, so I guess it, it really, you know, if I were to, if you're to answer the first part of the question, I would say, you know, you want to look at a, maybe a, a multi-grain, um, whole wheat type of bread. Um, and then the second one was, oh, the, the wild caught versus gosh. Um, I don't know that there's really a health, disparity between the two. Now there, I mean, there's lots of environmental uh, issues there and I am not at all educated on that one. But I think from a health perspective, um, there's probably a little, little difference there. Okay. I guess maybe if like, unless you want to like take mercury out of it, but I mean like, I wouldn't even know that there, if there's much of a difference there at all. Okay. Um, so we want to thank all of our uh, audience for their questions tonight and for Dr. Feinberg for answering many of those. Uh, any additional can be emailed to pr at uh, bch.org. Uh, 